All right, chapter five. So in chapter five, we're gonna learn about this thing called the T distribution. And in order to make the T distribution make sense, what I'm gonna do is give you a little bit more information about what we've been doing in the past. Information you didn't need when we did it in the past, but might be relevant now that we have more options, it'll turn out. So what I'm saying is in chapter three and chapter four, we've been studying this thing called the normal distribution. All, right, all of our problems you've seen assume the shape is normal, or even if the shape wasn't normal, we learned the central limit theorem, which told us that the shape of the sampling distribution would be normal. Uh, there's this thing called the normal distribution. By the way, it's also called the Z distribution. I don't think I've told you that yet. You haven't needed to know that yet, but it's true. Another name for the normal distribution is the Z distribution. And what this is, is one very specific symmetric bell-shaped curve. Maybe I even write that, that this is just one symmetric bell-shaped curve. And I didn't really harp on that. I just said we have the symmetric bell-shaped curve. It's really important. A lot of things in nature have this shape. The central limit theorem turns things that don't have this shape into things that do have this shape. Um, but we haven't talked about, is it possible that there's other symmetric bell-shaped curves? Turns out there are. Here they are. In blue here is the distribution we've been studying. Right? Note that when you're three standard deviations above or below the mean, these are all z-scores down here, you're really far out into the tail. Uh, we have been studying the area underneath this blue curve so far in this class. It's called the standard normal distribution. These are referring to z-scores. At any rate, the thing in blue is what we've been studying. Note that the thing in red and green and green again for some reason also are symmetric and they're also bell-shaped. But the area underneath these guys is different than the area underneath the blue guy. Like, look to the right of three, for example. We know from the empirical rule that there's very little area to the right of three underneath the blue curve. But if you look underneath the red curve, there's a fair amount of area to the right of three underneath the red curve. The property of the T distributions, note that's plural, compared to the Z distribution, singular, is that the T distributions have fatter tails. They have more area out in the tails. And you're like, Whoa, what's going on here? Why? Why is there these different distributions? Why is the area different? Why have you not told me any of this yet? Well, let me show you. So much of what we do works with the Z distribution. The central limit theorem works really nicely with the Z distribution. All the questions you've asked so far in this class, they work great with the Z distribution. However, there's one key assumption that you've just let it slide Maybe I'll even write one key unrealistic assumption. And that is you can only use the Z distribution if you know the population standard deviation. So one key unrealistic assumption in all these problems is that we know sigma. And just in case you're not comfortable with these symbols yet, this is the population standard deviation. And you're like, why is that so unrealistic? Well, think about confidence intervals, for example. In a confidence interval, you don't know the population mean, but you know the sample mean, and you can use that to estimate the population mean. Okay, great. But you can only estimate the population mean if you already know the population standard deviation. That's kind of weird. Why would you know the population standard deviation but not the population mean? Why would you have this information here? And to be perfectly honest, you probably wouldn't. And a lot of the problems we've seen so far, I said, you somehow know that the standard deviation of all and then whatever we're talking about is something. I've been giving you sigma in every single problem, but a much more realistic scenario is if you don't know sigma. Turns out there's a downside, there's a problem. If you don't know sigma, can't use the normal distribution anymore. Fortunately, there's another symmetric bell-shaped curve called the t-distribution. Or maybe I should say bell-shaped curves. Maybe that should be plural because really there's lots of different t-distributions. What am I talking about? A lot of different t-distributions. Okay, so here's the logic. This standard normal distribution, right? Think about if I want to capture, I don't know, 95% of the observations. I better go up and down by two standard deviations, right? Give or take. Our empirical rule told us that about 95% of observations lie within two standard deviations of the mean. So if I want to capture 95% of observations, I better go up and down by two standard deviations. But think about if you don't know what the standard deviation is. Think about if you don't know the population standard deviation. Well, if you estimate the population standard deviation, maybe based on like a sample standard deviation, 
then you're guessing at what the standard deviation is. And if you go by up and down by two of your guesses, you might not get 95% of the area by going up and down by two of your guesses because your guess might be off. So to account for the fact that you might be estimating that incorrectly, maybe the standard deviation is really 20 in the population, but in the sample, I calculate it to be 19. If I go up and down by two 19s, I haven't really gone up and down by two standard deviations. So what I have to do to account for that is I have to go up and down by more than two 19s. Right? I have to go up and down by more than two of whatever the sample standard deviation is to account for the fact that that standard deviation might be smaller than the real population standard deviation is. And so that idea that I have to go up and down by more to capture a given area in the middle is why the T distributions have fatter tails. Why are there multiple T distributions? Well, it depends on how good your estimate for the standard deviation is, right? If I estimate the population standard deviation by using the sample standard deviation and that sample standard deviation came from a really, really large sample, then it's a pretty good estimate at the population standard deviation, right? So if I estimate my population standard deviation well using a good sample standard deviation, well, then there's not as much area in the tails here. Then the T distribution is gonna look really close to the Z distribution. But if I do a poor job of estimating the population standard deviation, maybe if I estimate the population standard deviation with a sample standard deviation, and my sample's really small, then it's a bad estimate. So I'm gonna need a ton of area in the tails. Maybe in my example where I said the population standard deviation is 20, maybe it's possible that my sample standard deviation would be way off, like as low as 15 if that sample standard deviation only came from a handful of observations, like five observations. So the idea is there is a different T distribution for each sample size, because your sample size determines how well you are estimating your population standard deviation. And if you're estimating it really, really well, well then your T distribution is basically the same as your Z distribution. But if you're not estimating it really well, well, then there's a big difference between your T distribution and your Z distribution. Namely, you need a lot more area out in the tails to account for the fact that that estimation might be wrong. Anyways, the short takeaway, what you need to know is, and this, I don't know if I could write it in all capitals, that might be obnoxious. I'm going to do it. Use T distribution if you don't know sigma. It's that simple. If you're estimating means and you don't know the population standard deviation, then you can't use the Z distribution. That's why in every single problem so far, I've told you the population standard deviation sigma every single time I've told you that. Anytime we've been talking about numeric data, I've been giving you the population standard deviation. If you don't know the population standard deviation, you can't use the Z, AKA the normal distribution. You gotta use the T distribution. Okay, I got some good news. The T distribution is very similar to the Z distribution. In fact, all the things we've been doing so far, there's kind of a T version of them. Like for example, if you hit stat and then go to tests, I've been telling you just use the Z test when you have numeric data, no problem. Right below it is something that says T test. And guess what? T test is gonna be really similar to Z test. It's gonna be how you do hypothesis testing if you don't know sigma. So the key takeaway from this video is if you don't know sigma, and maybe in parentheses, and instead know S, right? you can always get S. S is just your sample standard deviation. You have some sample, you can always calculate the standard deviation. If you don't know the population standard deviation, instead know the sample standard deviation, you have a T distribution. And what we'll see in the coming videos is that you can do confidence intervals and you can do hypothesis testing. You can even do inverse norm and normal CDF, but they won't be inverse norm and normal CDF because the norm part of inverse norm and normal CDF is referring to the normal distribution. So you can only use them if you know sigma. We're gonna go through and redo a lot of the things we've done in the past, just making note of the fact that there's also this thing called the T distribution. We'll talk about how you recognize what to do and how to do it. But that'll really be the key to chapter five for most people. If chapter four goes okay, chapter five is easy because it's kind of more of the same, right? If you understood hypothesis testing and confidence intervals the first time around, numeric, when we were dealing with means, you'll have no problem with chapter five. You're just going to be selecting a different function on your calculator. One last comment. Um, in 
chapter 4, we also saw proportions. Proportions always follow a Z distribution. And that's for pretty complicated statistical reasons that I don't really want to get into. But the big takeaway here is you're like, wait a minute, you're telling me if I have sigma, the population standard deviation, then it's a Z distribution. And if I instead know S, the sample standard deviation is a T distribution, what about with proportions? There was no population standard deviation, right? There was no sigma, there is no S when you're dealing with proportions. There's a formula to come up with the standard error that's based on P's and N's, the square root of P times one minus P over N. But there is no sigma. So what do you do if there is no sigma? Well, it turns out if there is no sigma, you could still use a normal distribution. So proportions always follow a Z distribution. This big difference between Z's and T's is only an issue when you have numeric data, not when you have binary categorical data.